O oh God of grace and mercy, God of wisdom, we offer our thanks this morning. We offer our praise to you for your continued presence, your continued work in our community, inspiring us to continue to work as well. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each and every heart be acceptable to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So the king is dead. Long live the king. Now these are words that we might hear or might remind us that are said when a king dies and a new ruler, a new person becomes the king. It is the way that the living acknowledge the kind of acknowledge the passing of the baton from one king to the next. The way that the living honor and acknowledge the service of the old ruler and well wishes for the new ruler. I think there's also an implication of good wishes for the departed one, for a peaceful and eternal life, while also good wishes for the, the new king for an abundant and prosperous earthly life. Now this summer, we've walked through the story of King David, through the life of King David. We've walked through his time as a boy, as a shepherd in the wilderness, witnessing him being anointed by the prophet Samuel to be the king of Israel. We've watched his failures, been witnesses to the covenant promises that have been offered by God. We've heard about David's sins and about God's forgiveness in David's life. But we now come to the end of his story. King David is dead. Long live the king. Solomon is now seated on the throne. Long live the king. And we know from our own faith and our biblical witness that these two kings have a legacy that will live on for centuries, that will live on for millennia. Their line will go all the way down to Jesus Christ and by extension to each and every one of us. King Solomon is perhaps best remembered for his wisdom, for his just and righteous rule over God's people. I thought a lot about wisdom this week, so I looked it up in Webster's Dictionary. What, is, what did Noah Webster have to say about wisdom? Well, Webster's defines wisdom as the ability to discern inner qualities and relationships. Sounds like Solomon. I think, in other words, a wise person as someone who can tell good from evil. Someone who can see the impact of the decisions that he or she will make. The impact of those decisions on other individuals and on communities. A wise person is someone who thinks through his or her choices. Looking at it from all angles before making a final decision. Amen. Thank you, Josh. And we see from today's reading that we, the words we heard Eric read is that wisdom is, in fact, it's a gift from God. And what a beautiful gift it is, right? Wisdom allows us to put other people first. Wisdom allows us to go back and correct the mistakes that we have made in our past. Wisdom allows us to seek redemption, to seek forgiveness in our God. And we see all of this as Solomon begins his time as king. We are told early on that Solomon lived by the laws set forth by his father, King David. Sounds great. But then the very next sentence tells us that he worshipped that's King Solomon worshipped at the high places. Now the high places were temples and altars 
that were specifically built forbidden to God's people as places of worship. Solomon should not be there. Solomon should not be worshiping in this place, these places. Solomon should, in fact, be offering his worship, his offerings, his sacrifices at the Ark of the Lord, which we heard about a month ago that King David has moved to Jerusalem. Not, King Solomon is not meant to be at these high places. But God makes a way for Solomon through this. While Solomon is at this forbidden place of worship, God appears to Solomon in a dream. And God asks Solomon, what do you desire? What do you wish for? Hmm. Now many of us, myself included of course, faced with the same choice might ask for money. Might ask for a long life. Perhaps the most noble among us would ask for health and happiness for people in our community. For our families. But Solomon asked for something else entirely different. Solomon asks for wisdom. Which is wise in itself. Solomon asked to be a good leader for God's people. Rather than seek exaltation, Solomon asks to be a good servant. And because of this very thoughtful and unselfish request to God's, to God's question, God grants Solomon this great wisdom. And the Bible also tells us that God gives him a wise and discerning mind. And because he sought first to honor God, God also grants him long life, riches, and honor. These are secondary to Solomon and to God. And while Solomon may not have been wise enough initially to avoid the high places, to avoid these forbidden places of worship, this gift from God allows him to correct his mistake. Because at the end of his dream, we are told that Solomon returns his worship to the proper place in Jerusalem. He is worshiping God according to the law. Now we in the United Church of Christ, I think, understand the wisdom that God has given to each of us. And God has given us so much wisdom, my friends. We know that our true wisdom lay in our collective hearts. Our true wisdom lay in our collective minds. We are wiser together than we are alone. We are best able to discern our future when we put our heads together. When we put our hearts together. And that is the very core of congregationalism. Because every voice matters here. Our scriptures repeatedly teach us that every single person who makes up the body of Christ is a saint. A saint. Each person who makes up the body of Christ, a part of the body of Christ, is part of that priesthood of all believers. So we are all saints. We are all priests. And that is the way God has intended it to be. And just like the body needs all of its members... Our church needs all of its voices. Our church needs dreamers. People who can imagine all the possibilities for our community. People who will reach for the stars at every single turn. Our church also needs realists. People who are grounded in the realities of everyday life. People who look both ways before crossing. And also very important to the life of our church are skeptics. People who may be overly cautious about any sort of change. People who always want to look at the other side of the coin. It's not only our dreamers who are priests, my friends, who are saints in the eyes of God, but all of us are. Our dreamers, our realists, and our skeptics alike. Our dreamers show us the endless ways we can abandon the trappings of this life and fully live into who God calls us to be. And that's a tall order. 
And our realists teach us to plan for the future. Making sure that we have the knowledge, making sure we have the know-how to get where we want to go. To get where God is leading us. And that's a tall order. And our skeptics encourage us to be good stewards of our resources and to properly prepare for the days ahead. And that's a tall order. Lots of tall orders. But we do it together. And that's the joy. Imagine our church without any of these. We wouldn't be here. Now the Apostle Paul, when he's talking about the diversity of the body of Christ, in 1 Corinthians 12, he writes, Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them. So it is in our wisdom, friends, that we as a community know that each of us has a place in the body of Christ. Solomon teaches us, and Solomon knew that he must first serve God, and that in serving God, he would be strong enough to serve God's people. God first gives him the strength to go out and serve the people of God. And the lesson is the same for us. When we put God first, when we serve God first, we truly understand the diversity in this world that our God has created. That each and every one of us is unique and special. All of us. And each of us is as different from the other as the hand is from the foot. Or as the ear is from the eye. And that's what makes it special. That's what makes the ordinary so glorious. And we know that as parts and members of the body of Christ, that the body of Christ cannot exist without all of its members. And it's my prayer this day and every day that in kindness and love, we in this church and in our world will continue to value the diversity of thought will continue to value our diversity of mind, will continue to value our diversity of heart in each and every person that we meet. May it be so.